please welcome Ariel. Hi, I'm Ariel. Um, I'm a scientist. My job is to work with cooks to figure out uh, the science behind food and cooking. Um, but something that we're also interested in uh, with my job is using the knowledge that we produce by doing that uh, to improve the world. So um, you may have heard about food waste, including just now. Um, but it's a, it's a big problem in the world. Um, each year, we waste about 1.3 billion metric tons of edible food. Um, and that happens on every continent and uh, at every link in the food chain, from um, farms to distributors to markets to uh, people's home kitchens and uh, restaurants. So, it's a complex problem that's not going to be solved by any uh, one idea. Um, some parts of it, like uh, cosmetically uh, less desirable fruit and vegetables, um, can be dealt with by developing alternative markets for, uh, for, these, for this produce, um, such as frutifea in Portugal. Um, and these provide, uh, provide a way for these to be distributed bypassing the inefficiencies of conventional ones, which tend to uh, uh, follow E regulations that say that a strawberry that looks like that or a curvy cucumber uh, can't actually be sold because it doesn't pack well. But um, tonight I'd like to tell you a little bit about how our experiments in fermentation have given us some really interesting tools for dealing with food waste. Um, so this is where I work. It's uh, four shipping containers uh, in the back parking lot of Restaurant Noma. Um, we built this lab to have a space to study food practically, uh, not so much to make new dishes, but to make new knowledge. Um, and we built a lot of it ourselves, uh, as you can tell from the wiring job on our thermal controllers. Um, and this is uh, Noma head of R&D, Lars Williams, looking quite skeptical about my painting abilities. but. Um, you may be wondering what I'm doing in a semi-apocalyptic bunker in a parking lot behind a restaurant. Um, and I'm not gonna lie, a lot of the scientists I went to grad school with kind of shrug and say like, hey, you really don't need a PhD to do what you're doing to work with a restaurant, but if it makes you happy, I guess it's your life. Um, <laughs> But really, um, I left the academic system to work at MAD, not because I wanted to stop doing science, but because I think that some of the most powerful and interesting and innovative new ideas about food are coming out of restaurants, not out of university labs. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so spaces like the one that we've built let us experiment with things like Aspergillus orize, uh, that is this moldy stuff back here um, that's rich in culinarily useful enzymes. Uh, but more broadly speaking, it uh, lets us combine scientific and restaurant approaches to uh, make more better knowledge about food faster. Um, so the reason that we have this mold uh, is that one of the big projects that we're working on is fermentation. Um, and fermentation is the transformation of food ingredients by microorganisms such as bacteria, yeasts, and molds. Um, it occurs spontaneously. Uh, a lot of these microorganisms are just like in the air, on our skin, on various other surfaces. Um, so it's been a part of human gastronomic history since we've been eating fruit or making grain porridges or uh, milking cows. Um, but it also creates complex new flavors in ingredients that we'd otherwise overlook because they're bland on their own or we consider them waste products. Basically, it turns trash into treasure. And um, in doing some of this studying fermentation, oops, sorry, I recently went to Japan um, where I wanted to visit the grandmothers and guys with gigantic vats of squid sauce out their back sheds and people who've been making miso for 10 generations to learn some of the things about fermentation that um, 
that I wasn't going to learn in books or academic papers. So here we're grinding some soybeans to make miso. Um, Japan is one of the most food-obsessed cultures on Earth, and a lot of extremely delicious things are made out of materials that we might otherwise write off or overlook. So um, this is a uh, winter turnip pickle. Um, a lot of the winter tsukamono or pickles are made of turnips. Uh, this one's called suguki. And um, through a series of saltings and pressings and careful fermentations at different temperatures, the turnips transformed into this incredibly uh, complex, rich, meaty pickle. Um, and the greens are some of the best part. Uh, and in this raw state, the greens are sort of more of a throwaway material. And um, each of these pickles retails for about like seven or eight dollars a piece. Um, Going? Okay, this is another turnip pickle called Senmai. If you can see it, it's sort of like lots of overlapping slices. Uh, and this is a turnip and kelp pickle. Um, seaweeds are a good example of a plant that grows in lots of different places that uh, a lot of cultures don't even really consider as a food source. But in um, sort of natural resource poor areas like Japan, they've recognized its potential and uh, developed it into a uh, really flavorful and highly prized food source. Basically, to make, uh, to make these delicious products, they've taken like an unsexy vegetable and a weed. And by recognizing the inherent potential for flavor in these ingredients, they've developed uh, techniques to realize that potential. Um, and a parallel to that, what we found in Copenhagen is that uh, we can use fermentation to realize the full flavor potential of many different kinds of waste and food scraps. Um, so since it's the evening, uh, we thought you might like to have something to drink. I think that was passed around beforehand. Um, so there's some whiskey in that drink. If you haven't had it yet, it's, uh, it's at the back. Um, in part because our jailhouse bread wine uh, isn't quite ready for prime time yet, but 67% um, of that drink is pumpkin scraps that we fermented into vinegar. Um, yeah. <laughs> So uh, when we're fermenting, basically what we're doing is a sort of micro-environmental engineering where we're creating conditions using salt and temperature and oxygen that uh, allow the microbes that we want to grow and flourish and transform food into something delicious. And um, we're using all different kinds of techniques like making vinegars, doing lactic fermentations, um, uh, making kombuchas and then doing like protein-rich fermentations using that mold that you saw before uh, to make lots of enzymes and then break down a legume or an animal protein. But basically the takeaway that I'd like you to have from this is that um, I hope you can tell by tasting that dealing with waste sustainably doesn't have to be a big pain in the ass. Um, it's just about rediscovering the ways that these waste and scraps can be delicious. And to be honest, you know, working together, we only stumbled upon waste fermentation um, as a technique because we were already interested in fermentation because fermentation is delicious. Um, and to be able to get the sort of tangy and umami and other flavors that you get from fermentation using Nordic ingredients, uh, it became necessary to learn about enzymes and molds and spores and fungus and different bacteria and oxygen levels and salinity. Um, but once we had that knowledge and we're using it regularly, it became trivially easy to apply it to the problem of waste fermentation uh, or dealing with food waste. Um, but uh, if we'd approached food waste without having developed that uh, appreciation for flavor to begin with, we wouldn't have been able to just brute force innovation um, out of nowhere. So um, uh, some of the stuff we want to do going forward is figuring out some of the more complicated things about fermentation, like how do different temperature profiles affect the enzyme levels in our molded barley that we then uh, use to make a leftover meat or leftover bread soy sauce, and uh, how do those enzymes eventually impact flavor? Uh, other questions like that. But um, what each of these comes down to is that if we're going to tackle waste in a sustainable way, and other food issues in a sustainable way. We have to do it with an eye to flavor. And speaking as a scientist, nobody understands flavor and deliciousness better than cooks do. Um, as a little bit of a, a circling back, at the very first MAD here in Copenhagen, uh, this is in 2011, David Chang also gave a speech about 
doing fermentation at his restaurant. He's an American chef. He has a restaurant called Momofuku in New York. And one of the things that he said um, about having worked with microbiologists from Harvard is that, uh, oh, well, we need them more than they need us, um, which is a nice sentiment, but I think it's actually the other way around, because uh, we're standing here in 2015. Um, we have greater technical knowledge of food than we've ever had before, and uh, we also have uh, the patenting of indigenous plants' genomes for the sake of so-called technical progress and um, bee life about to be wiped off the planet from pesticide use for intensive agriculture and uh, the making and eating of soylent instead of real food, um, food waste, as we said before, uh, antibiotics about to become a thing of the past because of the way that we concentrate our feedlot-based uh, meat growing or meat cultivation. Um, so, not to be a fatalist, but um, if, if these results are what we get from combining food and science the way that we've always done it, like, yes, we absolutely need cooks as part of the scientific progress. Um, so, if there's any takeaway I'd like you to have from this, it's that um, seeking out knowledge, uh, the impetus for knowledge that sticks and tools that enable it sustainably all comes down to flavor. And uh, so, please enjoy your drinks and uh, tip your waitress. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>